Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second event in the Women's Day, the Women's Day series. Today, we'll be focusing on protecting and mobilizing youth in the COVID-19 response. And today, we're joined by three phenomenal women. We are so fortunate to have them here today and give up their time. So on the onset, I just want to express gratitude to all of you for joining in and to our panelists. First up, we have Fasia Hassan, who is the youngest member of the Gauteng Provincial Legislature at the age of 25. And she's responsible for oversight. She is a lawyer. She's also a former VC, so we're very excited about that and recently received an award for a student peace prize, which actually celebrated students for their work in activism and social justice. And then we have Farai Mumbihiwai, and she's the founder of Africa Matters, as well as the partner management lead at the Youth Employee Employment Services. She calls herself an African hybrid, which I thought was very cute in the interview, uh, because her parents are from Zim and South Africa. The organization was launched in 2015, and it focuses on building leadership skills, hosting webinars with change makers in Africa, and basically focuses around youth, um, youth empowerment. And finally, we have Vishle Ngobosi, who is a lecturer at the School of Governance. She focuses on development and governance, and very proud of her because she recently launched a book on Mothers of the Nation, the Manana Women in South Africa. She's previously worked as a researcher and focused on the development of LGBTI rights in Southern Africa. So I want to welcome you to the session. It's a very conversational one. So I encourage, you, encourage all of you to please use our chat function um, to just post in your comments and your questions. And I wanted to start off the session today by letting the panelists speak about their experience during COVID-19. What, you know, what have they been going through? What have they been feeling during this process? And I'm inviting you, all of you, to also leave, leave a comment, just to, just to touch base with us and let us know how you've been doing and how you've been coping with this process, be it today, be it the last couple of months, but we would just like to have and establish that emotional connection with you. So I will ask um, Farai to start with her reflection, then we will have Lish there, and then we'll go to Fasia. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much um, for, yeah, for this incredible platform and for the incredible speakers. I look forward to not only sharing, but also learning from, from everyone else on here. And I, I look forward to the different questions that come through. In terms of um, having reflections on COVID-19, it has been a, a difficult time, especially for our family. We lost my uncle um, a few weeks ago to COVID-19, and I think that really highlighted the reality that we are facing. It made us, yeah, it, it made us way more cautious than we were before. Um, we often say that you don't realize how hectic COVID-19 is until you've lost someone um, in your own family that you care so deeply for. That being said, it also has been a time for us to say, all right, what do we do better? And not just from a governance and an economic perspective, where a lot of countries and their governments are realizing that 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 inequality, racism, um, capitalism were just systems that weren't working before. How can we build back better? That's a slogan that the UN is using. But also from an from an, an, an individual perspective, it's been a time for us to, to really reconcile with them. Having experienced lockdown, knowing that so many other people have lost their jobs, what can I be grateful for? But what can I do much better in our, in our society? So knowing that society won't go back to normal, how can I play my part? And these are the sort of conversations that I'm having a lot with my partner, where we, where we reflect on what sort of world do we want to leave behind? I've been having it with my family and also with my friends as well. So I think it has been a difficult time, 
but a very reflective time. And my hope is that post COVID we'll build back better, a world that is so different to how it currently looks and a world that really is inclusive. Thank you so much, Farai. Basia, are you, are you okay to go next? Um, okay. I would prefer if I could go last on this one. Sure, sure. Lise Claire, do you mind going next with your reflection? We, we, Lise Claire, sorry, we cannot hear you. You sit, unmute. Oh, sorry, I forgot to add it. I should be used to this by now. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's been a very, very difficult experience, specifically around just dealing with being so far away from family and not being able to um, see people as frequently as you would. Um, there's a term that um, people use. Um, it's called Amakoduga, and that's normally people that are from the Eastern Cape that come to Johannesburg for work. And then they sort of migrate between the two cities. So those type of people like myself don't really have a lot of family in Joburg. So it's particularly different for us, I mean, difficult for us to um, be here without that family support. And also knowing that the Eastern Cape as well is just, um, Part of one of the hot spots specifically around funerals so it's quite difficult to lose family members that side and then not being able to attend funerals just because it's such a high risk um, and also just on a personal level it's quite um, the psychosocial fatigue I think it's settling in now in terms of just the mental health um, the mental health aspect of it is increasingly difficult and I'm just finding myself grateful to be able to afford psychosocial support um, and I know that it's not a lot of people have that um, privilege to be able to afford it so I think um, it is quite a difficult time and I do think that mostly for me it's just the intimacy of death that this 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 um, pandemic is just bringing it's just that you never know, you know, some one person might be fine and the next person, you know, you can lose them within 24 hours of finding out that they contracted um, the virus. So it's just the uncertainty of who's gonna make it and who won't and it just being about lack of the draw as opposed to, you know, somebody that is healthy and you know exactly that they'll be able to make it. So it's just a lot of things that it's incredibly frustrating, but I'm grateful to be alive. <laughs> and um, yeah, hopefully things get better. Thank you so much for sharing. I'll now hand you over to Fasia. Uh, thanks, Kamantha. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, look, it's 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 been quite a quite a roller coaster. Um, I've also lost quite a few yeah family members, elderly. Uh, but um, also just having difficulties of not being able to be there and not being able to to sort of be together, not just as a family, but as a, as a community in such a difficult time. I think it's, it's very uncharacteristically not South African. You know, we're very much family orientated, very orientated about being around each other. Um, but also, you know, for... For us, work hasn't stopped. There wasn't a time where we were not working, um, but being in communities, being on the ground has been beyond eye-opening. Um, and I've also had a number of different scares uh, of, of COVID. In fact, there's a bit of a running joke in, in our circles that I've probably had it several times. Um, but of course, I, I, I have no idea. And as a young person, you know, you keep telling yourself that um, as much as you're less at risk, you still have to be careful and you're still a potential carrier. Um, so it's been it's been quite insane, and it's been um, I think Lisa spoke about mental health. I think that's something that we're only going to reflect on a bit later, just how terribly decimating it's been to mental health. Um, but I just I just take things one day at a time, and some days like today are really hectic, and other days are a bit more manageable, and and that's kind of my coping mechanism. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. I really appreciate that. I think it was very necessary to kind of just touch base with where we are because we've been having so many of these conversations and, you know, we just kind of sort of, sort of go into, the, into, into it so quickly. And I just thought it was important to just pause and have, have that kind of interaction. So the, for the next um, 10 minutes, we're going to have presentations by all three speakers. You're more than welcome to use the Q&A function 
to put your questions in um, before we open up the floor. And yeah, so I would like to hand over to Farai, if, if you could lead us through your first presentation. And I know that you want to put up your presentation, so please go ahead. So let me just get this loaded. All right, so something that has been so interesting for us with the Africa Matters team, and especially working at YES and the, and the, and actually the space for youth, for youth development, is actually how has COVID-19 affected African youth? And how do we then recover from the effects of COVID-19? And I think this is a really important conversation to have, particularly with the continent we come from and the different challenges that we face. So, so in this short presentation, I'll be taking you through COVID-19, its impact on African youth, and also what that then means for us. And what I'm hoping to highlight is a more, is a more positive outlook in terms of what we can do as African youth amidst this pandemic that we're currently facing. And so I think what's really important to understand, and this is where it's important to contextualize, but it's that COVID-19 has had incredible effects. Um, we know that life will never be the same. COVID-19 has changed our society forever. On a, global state, on, a, on a global scale, we see healthcare is way more important. And we realize that jobs that were deemed as low skilled are actually so critical to keep our society going. In times of a pandemic, you ask yourself, who do I need more? Um, my asset manager or do I need my healthcare worker? And those have been really interesting reflections that we're finding ourselves in. What we've also seen as a result of COVID-19 is economic declines of up to even 20% resulting in business closure, high levels of unemployment and increased rates of poverty. On a continental scale, we see that there's an urgent need for us to strengthen our healthcare systems. We have a greater need for more healthcare workers, but there's also a lingering fear of what is to come. What will a post-COVID-19 Africa look like? And what do we then have to do to ensure that it's a conducive society for all? On a personal scale, there has been a, a lot of reflection. Um, my, my, my fellow speakers have mentioned aspects of mental health and, and the concerns there and the different challenges we face. But there's also been a change in mentality to say, how can I better play my part in my society? And lockdowns have resulted in a, in a lot of greater self-reflection around the world. Now, I think there are really important lessons to be learned from COVID-19, and I want to highlight five lessons, one of which would be youth unemployment, and that's the most important one. The first lesson that we've learned is that the West is not invincible. We saw really slow, slow and haphazard responses by Western governments to the COVID-19 outbreak. The second lesson we've learned is that African leadership is actually impeccable leadership. We've seen swift and decisive action from Rwanda to Senegal to South Africa. And I think that's been incredible because the world has had to learn from how Africa has handled this crisis and how we've handled it way better than a lot of our counterparts in the West. The third lesson we've learned is that quality healthcare is so important. All individuals must have access, not just to healthcare, but to quality healthcare. And we see that African leaders have had to actually face up to the reality of the healthcare system in their respective countries. For one of the first times as an African leader, you couldn't go to the UK to get medical treatment. You had to stay in your own country and experience the same system that your citizens are subject to. The fourth lesson we've learned is that healthcare workers are so needed. Pre-COVID-19, Africa already had a shortage of 2.3 healthcare workers per thousand population. This is way below the UN's prescribed 4.5 per thousand per population. And I'd say the fifth and the most difficult lesson for us to face and bear at the moment, which sort of brings us to the crux of this conversation today, but it's that youth unemployment in Africa will get worse. And that's just the reality that we're facing at the moment. Pre-COVID-19, Africa already had a youth boom, which by a lot of economists was seen as an economic burden. Economists, the UN, UNICEF, the African Union prescribed that the only way to combat this youth boom is if we are investing in the skills development, in the education, and in the strong social inf infrastructure within our different communities. Now, many African countries pre-COVID-19 
already had high levels of, of, of um, youth unemployment. In South Africa as well, for, for Q1, we saw youth unemployment as high as 59%. Now, Africa already has the largest youth population in the world with over, two, of, of, with, um, with over 30 million young people between 15 to 24. Now, essentially, for a country like ours with a huge youth population um, and, and you know, this, this large youth boom across the continent, if we're seeing economic decline in numerous African countries, what we are then seeing is high levels of youth unemployment. And that's where we currently are. The reality is that youth unemployment will get worse. It already is worse even within our own South African context. Now, I think what's important to highlight is that it is not all doom and gloom. And this is what I'm hoping to, to focus the conversation on, to say, yes, the reality is that so much needs to be done as we build back better post-COVID-19. That's even if there is a post-COVID-19. And as we realize that youth unemployment is particularly high and will continue to be high because of the economic impact of COVID, what can we as young people do? What can we as young Africans do? Now, the effects of COVID-19 and its lessons should actually serve as a motivation to us as African youth to be change makers within our society. Now more than ever, as we build back better, we need to be intentional and we need to work collectively. And I am truly someone that believes in the power of young Africans to really shape the continent we want, to shape the society that we want. Different motivations um, have been seen across the continent, and I've been really, really privileged to be able to witness what are young Africans in different parts of our continent doing to ensure that they are building back better, to ensure that in their own spaces, they are combating challenges of youth unemployment, and not only relying on government to address these challenges, but collectively working with government, with civil society, with any religious organizations, and with business as well. From an Africa Matters perspective, we have been um, running an online campaign now to raise funding so that we can empower adolescent girls and young women across 10 different African countries. And what's been really exciting is that our funding has picked up momentum and we should be launching um, an online masterclass directed only at young women from October onwards. The beauty in this is that the funding will enable each young woman to get data costs, but to also implement community-based projects within their own homes. We've then also seen in the second picture, I've had a really good friend, Ellen, um, who's from Malawi, who runs an, an organization that empowers women to not only develop their communities, but she's changed her business model lately to ensure that you've got women in your society who are making masks for those who don't have. In Nigeria, one of the One Young World Ambassadors started creating posters that are able to educate Africans about COVID in not only English, but across different languages. And that's been so important to get information out there. Another One Young World Ambassador from Kenya in the, in the bottom of the screen for the, for the Garden of Hope Foundation has set up um, hygiene stations in a lot of your taxi ranks so that people are able to wash their hands and practice safe hygiene using his own money and investments and ensuring that he's uplifting the society. From Africa Matters again, we launched a podcast during this time, knowing that people are spending so much time at home to be able to inspire young Africans to, to, to put action in, to change their communities. And from the YES perspective, which is a youth employment service, there's been this um, huge investment into, into young entrepreneurs, particularly township-based entrepreneurs, to create different business ventures, including the production of masks. So the reason I show you these six images is to highlight that, that yes, the situation post COVID-19 is not looking great, but what does that then mean for us as African youth? What sort of actions do we need to take to ensure that we are shaping and creating the societies that we want? And how do we do that without only saying it's government responsibility, but to say we also have a collective responsibility to play our part. And so I just want to end off with this in terms of, I mean, I often get asked, what can I as a young person do more of during this time? And the first and most important realization is that young people are not leaders of tomorrow. We are leaders of today. Whenever I hear any politician or anyone really say to me, you know, we have to create a society for young people because they're leaders of tomorrow. I disagree. We are leaders of today. And we have to start acting and leading today within our own spheres. You don't have to have a title or be in a huge position to be a leader. 
the very action, acts that you're doing in your own community is that leadership. The ability to wake up and join such a discussion, such a discussion is in itself leadership. So I've just highlighted eight points that I think as young people are super important for us to take home and how we can shape the Africa and the South Africa that we want. The first is that um, we need to value youth participation. As young people, it is very important that we are involved in processes and decisions that affect our lives. And Fasia is a great example of this. Her involvement and, and her being the youngest in her role and in what she does is so incredible. And how do we create more avenues for youth participation so that as we talk more about Fasia and what she does, there's not one person, but there are multiple young people like her that are shaking up space in that regard. The second is that we need to make youth advocacy a reality. How do we as young people keep making our voices heard? And how are we ensuring that our voices are not only heard on social media, but through, but through other channels so that we have an amplified voice? Number three would be how do, uh, how do we align our careers with our contributions to Africa? Very often when you ask a young person what they want to study, it's I wanna be an accountant so I can make a lot of money. But what about saying, I'm really good at accounting and finance. Let me look at what the gaps are on our continent that are related to, those, to that content, to those subjects. And let me fill those gaps using my skills. And the more we align ourselves and our skills with what our communities need, the more impact that we will have. The fourth thing to highlight is that as young people, we need to consider health as a career. And there are mul multiple entry points. There's not only working in the clinic, there is logistics, there's so much structuring, there's financial elements. So what is your entry point into healthcare? And that could be an option. Number five, for those who are, on, who, those who are entrepreneurial, exploring social entrepreneurship in your community is super important. And in doing that, solving youth unemployment, I think the more, the more we as young Africans have the mentality of not how do I become an employee, but how do I become an employer and empower those around me, the more change we'll see in the communities we come from. Number six would be, be really innovative. There's so many different ways in which we can create jobs. And my work at the Youth Employment Service focuses on this. How do we create even more jobs for young people that at times are even gig jobs that are leading to something else? Um, number seven would be read and share knowledge within, within your community. Don't keep knowledge to yourself. As we attend different webinars like this, what are we doing to share and disseminate this information outwards? And the last thing I'd highlight is that as young people, we have to play our part and we need to collaborate with others. And playing your part doesn't have to be this huge move. It doesn't mean you have to impact masses and masses of people, but even just playing your part and impacting the life of one person, your neighbor, your colleague, your sibling, that is super important. So as young people, we need to do more. And the post COVID-19 world highlights that our efforts are even more important and way more important than we thought they were. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was that. Thank you so much for that presentation. I love the fact that it was not all doom and gloom because that was so important to us when we decided to have this particular conversation because we wanted a level of inspiration, a level of engagement and ideas of what people can actually do. I mean, you know, probably someone out there is sitting with an idea and don't even know how to, to, to make it a reality. So your um, advice at the end in that last slide was so incredibly important. And I loved that you said align careers with the skills and the needs of the community because, I mean, you're an example of someone who's doing that and look at the impact that it is having. And while I was preparing for the session, I realized, you know, there were so many youth-driven technology um, innovations throughout the continent. Like in South Sudan, they had this uh, 2 on one share hashtag project where they were literally challenging misinformation using that hashtag and building a digital community to make sure that the right information about coronavirus was actually being spread. So that, that the points that you raised are just amazing. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Fasia, are you ready to do your presentation? Yes, yes, I'm here. Apologies about earlier, uh, you know, when, when things run over and they overlap, they just uh, make it a little bit difficult, but I'm here now, so I'm very happy to do that. Um, right, so I think it was incredible what Farai um, sort of started with, and in, in many ways, I'm actually going to be building on that, so it worked out quite well. The audience 
Hassan. I'm uh, a youth activist, um, but I'm also currently the youngest member of the Gauteng Provincial Legislature. Um, in this capacity, I sit in three portfolio committees. The first one is education, the second is economic development, which includes agriculture and uh, the environment, and then I also sit in um, and really we play, and this is where it's relevant, we play an oversight role over government. We're also lawmakers, we're policy makers. I'm not speaking on behalf of any government department. Um, I'm speaking more from a legislator and a, an oversight um, sort of perspective. So, can you hear me now? Yeah, sorry, Fusia. You, you, there's just like an interference and breaking up. So can we just try that again? Sure. And and if it happens again, please don't worry. Just interrupt me, and I can I can repeat. I don't want my my message to get lost. Uh, now, can I continue? Yeah, you can. Okay. All right. The other alternative is I can put in earphones. That might help. Uh, but let's see how it how it goes. Sure. So yes, I'm saying that um, I sit in those three portfolio committees and we play this oversight role. Um, but I really just want to build a bit on what Farai was saying around COVID nineteen presenting. In some ways, it's giving us this 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 idea and this thinking that we can kind of do a bit of a factory reset. You know, you do a factory reset on your phone and you can kind of just start again. Um, and in some ways, COVID-19 is giving us this, this, this particular opportunity to reset in a way that's more substantively just, more substantively fair. Um, and I think that's also something that we need to take full advantage of. Um, the cashier shop, most people in society, like Farai said, Okay, people are having problems with my sound. Let me try my earphones. I think that might cancel out the, the background. Okay, Let me try thank that. You. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, Hopefully this... that will work. While, you get, while you're getting your sound sorted out, I just want to acknowledge some of the comments on our Facebook page. And thank you so much for sharing you know, your process during COVID-19. And for those of you who did post about experiencing losses, we just would like to say that we are deeply sorry um, for your loss and, and also for the di very difficult situation that some of you have been facing. But nonetheless, thank you so much for sharing. Okay, back to you. Okay, I, I, I'm hoping it's better. Uh, is, it, can you, so, yeah. So can far, you so me, good. better than before? Okay. Yeah. If there's any problems, interrupt me, I don't mind. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to continue. Um, so, yeah, the idea that the cashier at ShopRite plays a fundamental role in our society and, and not just upholding our society, but supporting us, right? Um, and it's what Farai had said earlier, are we looking more importantly at a hedge fund manager or a CEO vis-a-vis um, -vis like a cashier at ShopRite? So I think that COVID-19 has presented us with those unique opportunities of, of really removing um, a lot of the clutter and showing us what's really important. Now, that being said, I also think we need to have an honest conversation um, about the response um, or the youth response by government. Um, and like I said, I'm speaking in, in an oversight capacity. Yeah, I think initially we had um, a good response. I think our finger was on the pulse. Um, and what we had seen very interestingly, and I noticed internally, um, was the enhanced sort of intergovernmental relations. So enhanced um, um, work and not just work, but the, the ability to relate to each other on a municipal, that's a local level, a provincial level and national level. Um, and in many ways, COVID-19 kind of showed us that there's a lot of these bureaucracies and red tape that we have in place that don't actually help service delivery, that don't actually help um, the person on the ground. And I think COVID-19 presented us also with something really unique to show us, right, these things are important and these things are less important. Um, so I think we did see that initially. But we also have to be clear that COVID-19 didn't create poverty. It didn't create food security, insecurity on its own. These were issues that were vastly prevalent in society, including, including acutely high youth unemployment. Um, so we had alarming food insecurity, severe inequality, very high youth unemployment, and then COVID-19 happened. 
Um, and that really just exacerbated what was already in our society. Um, so it wasn't something that overly created these things, they just made it a lot worse. And I think when you look at it through that lens, it also shows us that we were definitely not a perfect society before. Um, and the fact that there was even more need of intervention now. Um, but I think in terms of some of the roles that we've been playing in oversight, and what I've acknowledged and what I've seen around the response focusing on youth, is that the focus of the COVID-19 response has largely been on those who are most vulnerable and medically at risk. You know, people with comorbidities, people who are older, people living with HIV or TB, et cetera, um, which in some ways has meant that young people haven't been the focus of the COVID-19 response, right? Um, and it's also partly because of the idea, and there is medical evidence that shows this, that young people are more likely to recover, are less likely to have hectic symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the byproducts of that is that, is that young people haven't been at the center of the focus. Um, and I think that's a big part of where we come in as, as lawmakers about forcing youth back onto the agenda um, and forcing it in a way that ensures the policy making prerogatives are centered around the impact on young people and are centered around the impact on women, people living with disabilities, um, people in a marginalized community. Um, so I think that's been particularly important and I'm gonna cite a few examples. So one of the things that um, we were able to positively advocate for is um, the youth brigades in our schools. And, I, and like I said, I'm speaking from a Gauteng level here. It's, I, I can't really comment on, 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 on a national or other provinces. Um, but what happened is they were able to gather a large amount of young people from various localities and deploy them into schools to do the screening, to do um, what we call in the scholar transport process, ensuring that there's social distancing, ensuring that kids are properly adhering to the COVID-19 regulations and ensuring that sort of everything's happening in the schools from a COVID perspective. Um, but it was a huge sort of, or rather, let me say it this way. What it exposed was what we already knew before. There was only a few thousand positions. I can't remember the exact name, but I think we got like 10,000 plus applications. Um, and so most of the people who applied, we, we, we couldn't look after, we couldn't actually take into, into the space. And I think that's also indicative of the fact that we have a crisis an absolute crisis of youth unemployment. Um, but this is one example in which we were able to utilize young people at the forefront of the COVID-19 um, approach. But we also sort of saw it, um, and this most recent weekend, we had a very long discussion with the Gauteng Enterprise Capella, which supports youth entrepreneurs in particular and women entrepreneurs. Um, and they have been trying to fast track a lot of the, the applications from um, young businesses or small businesses um, to try and get them both financial and non-financial support. One of the problems that we've encountered actually is a delay. So as much as everyone acknowledges we need to be providing this support, everyone still seems to be dilly-dallying, okay, you know, moving at, a, at, a, at an ordinary pace, even though we're in a complete crisis. So that's also been something we've been trying to push very hard on, um, but something that I think over the next few weeks, I think we're going to win because um, we're zeroing in on it. Um, and the last example I want to talk a little bit about is around the tourism industry um, and also the agriculture industry, where as a, as a Gauteng provincial government, we're pushing very hard, um, or rather as the legislature, we're pushing the government to push hard um, to, to avail more opportunities for young people in the hospitality sector, but also around, and I mentioned agriculture, utilizing community co-ops um, in a way that firstly ensures that the food value chain is not disrupted. That's been a big focus over the last few months, ensuring that um, food gets from or, or crops get from the actual farm to the supply market, market and ultimately to the shelves. Um, so one of the things people, well, no one's, I don't know if anyone's noticed it, but that's one of the big things we've ensured, that there, were food, there was food on the shelves and that nothing was interrupted in terms of that value chain. But we're looking at trying to put some funding and some support into what we call agri-tech. Um, so the idea is that these young community co-ops, um, can you share sort of this, these, these different innovative machines to try and speed up and make more efficient um, their, their farming processes so that they'll be able to take it to a scale much higher than they are now. Um, so those are just a handful of examples, but it's nowhere near enough. And I think that's also what I'm trying to put across, that I think there has not been enough of a youth focus um, um, from government's perspective. And it's something I keep reiterating in meetings and it's something I keep pushing across. And that brings me to one of my second last points that as much as what Farai said is true, we are young people in the space. There's a huge, huge problem of youth tokenism. So we're one or two young people in the portfolio 
opportunity. And, and this is the thing, right? It's not enough to have a seat at the table. It's about what do we use that seat at the table for and how seriously are we taken? Um, so that when I sit in that meeting and I say, well, what are we actually doing um, about young entrepreneurs or what are we doing about young healthcare workers who are particularly um, being exploited right now because they're young and because they're lower on the rung in terms of hospital sort of hierarchy. Um, and yes, they're saying the right things, but how do we ensure that on the other side, on the implementation side, on the executive side, something actually comes out of it? So for me, this, this crisis has also exposed um, a lack of representation, and I mean proper representation, not just having one or two young people in the space. Um, and then it's also exposed to, to me and to others how important it is for us as young people across different spectrums, across different types of communities, whether we are MPs, whether we're community organizers, whether we are students, there's a need for us to organize and there's a need for us to work together and utilize each other better because I feel like we're working in silos. So we're, we're working on one side, Farai is working on another side, civil society is on another side, and we're not coordinating our approach um, as a youth sort of targeted strategy. Whereas we, we all sort of had the same idea, but we're not putting it together. And I think there's, there's huge power in that. So that when we stand up in parliament, when we stand up in legislature, there's power to it. I'm not just speaking as one, as, as one person. And I think my last point um, is that I think we have been very reactive in our approach. Um, and I think that's something that we need to not just reflect on, but we need to start being more proactive because the impact of COVID-19 on the economy is horrific. I mean, it, uh, it's, it's decimated our economy. And we know that over the next five to 10 years, that's going to be our focus on rebuilding. So instead of being reactive in our policy making, we need to be more, pro more proactive. But I, I think I might have run out of time and some of the questions might uh, cover some of my other content. But thank you so much to Yukimantha and to the Wood School of Governance um, for the platform. Thank you so much for that. Um, I just wanted to just get some clarity in something. You know, you said that you bring these things up in these sessions and I just want to get a sense of, is there any feedback or is there any sort of conversation about how, how this will get better and this lack of representation or, or voice uh, voices in the space is it I'm sure it's not just uh, confined to COVID-19 so you know prior to COVID-19 how much of work do you have to, because I mean two two of you or three of you in parliament um, with, the, with, the, with the very strong youth voice I mean that's obviously not enough so yeah can you just comment on that please mm. Yeah, so before COVID-19, we had only been off in office for a few months, um, and I think we were still learning our way around things, uh, which is also another thing we need to have another panel discussion about, um, around how I don't think there's enough sort of intergenerational handing over the baton, so it was a bit of throw you in the deep end and sink or swim, um, so that's, that's one thing. But I do, I do have to emphasize the fact that it's not enough to just have that seat at the table. It's not enough to just have young people there and think, okay, automatically young people are going to have what they need um, and they're going to have that intervention that's actually implemented. Um, it's about the fact that I think there's also a culture from government officials um, who are not necessarily used to, sort of, you know, if you take a fine tooth comb and, and, and you comb things out and there's still issues that remain, you have to be top of your game all the time and you have to constantly be reading and you have to be constantly on top of your oversight. And I think one of the things that they have become accustomed to are public representatives not doing that. Um, and so there's this constant fight for us to hold them accountable, but when you do, they don't really have good enough answers. So I find myself often having to say in portfolio committee meetings where we meant to merely pay oversight, you know, we, we talk about the separation of powers, right? We just meant to law make and pay oversight. But the truth is, given some of these difficulties, you, you find yourself having to step into the shoes of that official and say, well, actually, maybe we must sit down and look at the strategy for tourism in, in the province now that we're on level two, because it seems like you don't know what you're doing, for example, you know? Um, so that's, that's another big thing and, and something that the lawyer in me often feels uncomfortable about. Um, but the activist in me says, well, we don't have a choice. We have to do what we have to do and ensure that um, even if we're micromanaging, maybe that's just what we have to do, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now we invite Gishli to take the floor and do her presentation. Here we go. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, I've unmuted myself. 
Um, thank you so much to the two um, panelists. I think they've set up quite a good framework for us to go with um, from a national level and sort of thinking through the national responses specifically around governing, I mean, governance and approaches to COVID-19 specifically around the youth. But I think why my area of interest specifically is around the ways in which COVID-19 has really exposed the nature of higher education and how um, it really has um, post feasimus fall, if we could even call it that, it really, COVID-19 has become sort of the next frontier, which is really showing us the different ways in which um, um, the, the, the systemic challenges are not only um, um, unique to the ways in which we socialize as human beings, but also within the ways in which our universities are constructed around the socioeconomic understanding of um, what is the purpose of the university? And in the moment of COVID-19, how has um, the pandemic and the responses around that, specifically towards higher education, how has that showed us um, the systemic challenges that are faced that are faced by the high, faced by the higher education sector? And really, what um, the youth insurgency, specifically around higher education, has shown us is that the university, specifically in the last um, 10 years or so, has no longer been seen as just a, a space or an arena for education, but there really are socio economic and political and inferences that we make in the ways in which universities function and the ways in which the universities conduct their affairs, specifically around being able to cater to varied um, class dynamics that are within um, the university space. So really what um, COVID-19 really has done, um, for those of us that have been following the trajectory and the nature of youth insurgency specifically within the university space, COVID-19 has really just um, illuminated the existing challenges that we've had. And it really hasn't presented any new types of challenges that we can look at and begin to say, oh, we've never expected this, or we've never had to deal with this type of issue before. And um, there are a number of issues that I would like to highlight specifically around responses, um, specifically tailored to the higher education sector and universities. Um, so really what the key issue that has been um, specifically around higher education, it really has been around this idea of um, this um, move towards um, blended learning or online learning and really making education this new digitized um, way um, of, of COVID-19. And I think this was a really important... Yeah, so we really are seeing now through COVID-19 this idea of the digitization of education. Um, we've seen vice chancellors across the countries from um, WITS as well as UCT, um, UJ as well as UP, specifically your seemingly um, previously white institutions. There really have been pushing for this um, idea of um, digitizing this higher education sector. And a lot of implications that come with that um, uh, which are not only limited to the teaching and learning environment alone, but it also speaks to the ways in which we are really seeing a different way in which um, the university is trying to um, remove itself from the socioeconomic implications or responsibilities that universities have. Um, we begin to see that if we look at COVID-19 and the ways in which it really has contributed to the um, accommodation and housing crisis specifically to youth who make use of the university as a, a resource specifically around housing and accommodation and now we're finding that students are having to move into their own homes as a space for um, creating the teaching and learning environment and we know that in South Africa specifically with the socio-economic um, issues that we have around poverty and housing and the nature of the student demographic in South Africa we know that the home is not really a conducive environment um, for teaching and learning. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, sorry. It's like, Kamantha, your screen was frozen, so I wasn't sure if you could um, hear me. No, um, be fine. Okay. So as I was saying that um, this crisis in terms of housing and accommodation and really shifting the space of education from the um, institution itself into the home place really does create significant challenges when we consider the nature of the demographic of the students that are in our universities. Um, and we really have seen as well within the space of three to four years that 
the university has now moved away from the majority of its demographic being physical and um, being um, fee paying students as opposed to now we are seeing a lot of students really depending on forms of um, um, financial support either from the state or really um, from the private sector. And so when we begin to think about the different um, socioeconomic impacts that it has to move the university experience from the physical institution to the home place, it really creates um, a ripple effect in the ways in which the teaching and learning environment becomes compromised. Um, we also know the home specifically has a lot of challenges when you think about um, the context of um, poverty and um, where students had um, the opportunity of really create, where the university rather created that buffer between um, the intimacy of poverty um, uh, with students then being away from their, from their homes, the inter that buffer no longer exists and students are now having to grapple with the intimacy of poverty in their home spaces while trying to um, facilitate this teaching and learning environment. But we're also seeing students always also having to grapple with the intimacy of death and the intimacy of loss. Whereas if students are not necessarily um, from, um, I mean, if students that are in res or um, seeking accommodation in the institutions, like I've said, there is that um, inherent buffer that the institution creates between the immediacy of socioeconomic issues um, that students would otherwise have to face if they're at home. And really there is no um, move towards really addressing that type of implication when it comes to moving the teaching um, and learning process away from the physical institutions and moving it more onto this digitized um, understanding of um, teaching and learning. Um, we also see that the idea of food insecurity as well really does become quite an issue when we think about what the university has come to represent in sort of the post Fees Must Fall era, where Fees Must Fall really agitated a more well-rounded conception of um, the university. But the university is not only responsible for teaching and learning, but there is an um, inherent socioeconomic dynamic that um, Fees Must Fall and other um, student-led activist projects, specifically in the higher education space, how um, they really called for a revamping of the ways in which we understand what type of institutions um, do we send students off to? And is the university um, sustainable if we, if we only conceive of it as a space for teaching and learning? So the socioeconomic imper imperatives that come with the university also include this idea of students having food security and also just having the basic security protections that otherwise they don't have when they're in their home spaces. And I do think that COVID-19 has really highlighted this to a further degree and really has shown um, the, the nature of the, the diff, sorry, has really shown the, the demographic of student that is now becoming more dominant in our universities. The university is no longer um, a space where it's privileged only for those who are fee paying, but also the increase in the number of students that rely on um, um, financial support, either from the state or other um, financial institutions, the, 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 the security of the university um, and the different securities that the university provides outside of the teaching and learning space become part and parcel of the teaching and learning environment. And when we strip that away from students or the COVID-19 um, or COVID-19 really requires the stripping away of those securities, we really then begin to see how the university in and of itself has a broader mandate um, beyond just the teaching and learning environment. And I do think that the more we begin to tease out the nature of higher education specifically in unequal societies like our own, we begin to reimagine this understanding of what an educational um, institution is supposed to provide. Um, yeah, and I also think that part of this um, understanding of security and the university becoming or providing these types of securities for um, students, we also then begin to think about the ways in which um, governance in and of itself has not taken seriously the nature of the university that we are now having to grapple with, but also the nature of the type of student that now comes into our universities. And all of these government initiatives um, tailored and geared around ensuring that the infrastructure of education um, in COVID-19, specifically around um, data, free rating, um, specific, um, zero ratings, um, websites, um, providing course material, 
all of those are important and they're significant for students to be able to continue with the teaching and learning process. However, what government has failed to do or has failed to recognize is that there is a social um, political dynamic that comes into thinking about what type of environments are we sending our students to? We've also seen the increase of gender-based violence um, in the home space specifically. And again, like I've said, in the absence of a buffer, such as the institution being made physically available to students, we're really beginning to see the intimacies of, the intimacies rather, of particular violences that students are now having to engage with in their home spaces and the different coping strategies that they are meant now to think through and to, and to devise in conjunction with them being adequately prepared to um, conduct their, their studies or to um, continue with the teaching and learning process. So I do think that in government's efforts to ensure that higher education or um, the education, teaching and learning process continues, we have neglected a sector of the um, psychosocial as well as the socioeconomic um, ways in which COVID-19 has significantly altered students' ability to um, deal with the um, socioeconomic crises that are inherent within um, their spaces due to the nature of the inequality that exists and also because of the nature of the type of student that our universities now attract. So yeah, I think I'll just leave it there and we can um, take some questions. Thank you so much for that. I, I wanted to, it, firstly, it was really great getting, obviously, a perspective um, from the side of the universities. Uh, I want to check the university, when you say that the university, uh, sorry, COVID-19 has sort of been pushing us to have a broader mandate. Do you see that as, as an opportunity for something bigger, a better way to do things? Uh, I think more as, I see it more as, as um, the inability of us to actually understand what the nature of a university looks like in a society like our own. So the university cannot just be seen as a space of teaching and learning. The university has inherently particular securities that it offers its students that um, otherwise they wouldn't be able to have. For example, your housing, your accommodation, your food securities and all of that. And I do think that this opens us or gives us the opportunity to really think about what do sustainable universities look like um, in the face of um, having highly unequal societies and also having the type of student that now is able to go to university. So in the absence of having this understanding of a more sustainable um, outlook of how universities are supposed to function, I don't think we'll be able to actually deal with um, what happens in the instance where these social securities provided by the university are stripped away and what implications in that has on students. Okay, thank you so much, Lucille. We do have a question that I would like to pose to all three of you. Um, it, uh, the question is, how, how will you link youth activism with global governance issues, most notably global health equity, and ensuring that if a vaccine is developed, it is affordable to Africans and others in the developing world? And who is it being tested on right now? And not all purchased by first world countries, the colonial matrix power at play. It is in our comment section, it is, it is quite a long one. So if you just wanna take a second to read it, um, and any one of you can respond to that. Um, how do you link activism? Farai or Fasti here? Yeah, Fasti, go, you, you can. You can respond, we see your hands up. Okay, sorry, I just have to put my earphones back in for my sound purposes. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just pulling it up here. Sure. Thanks, David, yeah, for the question. Um, you know, it's something I've been thinking about for a while, you know, in the moment we started to hear in which, um, vaccines were being uh, developed and, and started to be trialed, et cetera. 
my big concern um, and one of the things I've also been trying to, to sort of get across to people in different communities um, is that even once the, the, the trial is successful and there's a vaccine, it doesn't automatically mean that we're going to get access to it or that it's going to be accessible in our poorer communities. Um, and one of the things that people would have noted, well, I don't know if they have, but they would have seen maybe um, that the president and many other countries have sort of signed this global declaration around the fact that when um, a vaccine is found, it should be number one, not patented, and number two, it should be like more accessible and available to all these different countries. And one of the things that I think puts us or, or, or further exposes what we've been trying to say about this is that this is an opportunity where pharmaceutical companies can make a lot of money um, and can definitely patent it and can remove all the different elements of, of, of accessibility. Um, and it will be for those who can afford it, not those who deserve it. Um, and I think there's, there's a huge need for us as the global South to be organizing. But I also think that it requires um, identifying the right stakeholders, not just in South Africa, but all over the world um, and ensuring that we come to some sort of and yes, this may sound idealistic, but, but some sort of principled approach, because this is not a normal situation. Um, like Farai had said earlier, and I think Lizzie also said, I've talked about it, it's unprecedented. We've never, this is our wartime, um, our generation sort of wartime experience. Um, and if this is not something in which we can further our humanity, then I think, yeah, I think we're in a, in a worse off crisis. Um, but I think there's a huge role also for us as, as, as government to play, uh, or yeah, as legislature in particular, um, in ensuring that when the vaccine does come through, um, we, we, it's not just subsidized, it needs to be freely available. Um, and I do think that we need to um, prioritize the poorest of the poor. Um, and, and the most vulnerable. So the elderly, those with comorbidities, et cetera. And I think we need to be very unapologetic about it. We need to say, these are the people who are most at risk. These are the people who qualify to get the vaccine first and then move down the scale. Um, that's a personal opinion. That's not a, that's, yeah, I have to keep saying this. It's not a, a, a official position of government, but it's something I really believe strongly in. And it's something I've already started to advocate in within caucus to say, well, let's, like I said, let's not be reactive when the vaccine comes. Let's decide on our approach and our position now so that by the time it comes, we know what we're doing. Um, but I, I agree with you, this colonial matrix of power at play, it's always going to be there. Um, and the, the, the power dynamics are always set up against us. And that's why we need to be creative. And that's why we need to build allyships and we need to work with different um, stakeholders in the space so that the, when the, like the WHO can say, look, countries within Africa need to get it at this price. For example, you know, we need to be a bit more or more creative because we don't have the financial thuggery, so to speak, like a pharmaceutical company does to come in and say, okay, well, we're taking this. Or, or even Donald Trump, who said to, I think it was India, you know, when there was this hydro I can't say it now, but you know, he, he sort of said to India who was producing it, he was like, give us all of your, um, all of that uh, sort of particular drug. And because of their, their status as a superpower in the world, um, India in many ways just had to oblige for all of the other political problems, but they did oblige. Um, so it's quite clear that it exposes that further. Thanks. Thanks, Samantha. Don't want to speak too much. I know <laughs> others want to that, that's fine. Thank you so much. So the next question is, do, do you think capitalism can meet the demands of the post-COVID society? And um, that, all of these questions that are coming up are literally open to the three of you. So whichever one of you wants to answer, you're more than welcome to. Yeah, um, I'll give it a stab. Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think capitalism is just it's an untenable economic framework that we've been set up with. And I do think that it does not create a favorable environment to be able to capture the type of reform that will be required post the post COVID-19 um, world that we'll, 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 we'll then have to enter into. Specifically, I'm looking at, if you look at the labor market, I'm, I'm particularly concerned about the type of labor market that we'll be inheriting post COVID-19 and what are the implications of that particular market that will be severely devastated and also will be shrunken beyond what it is currently. And I don't think that capitalism in its insistence on a win or lose outcome, that it will create the type of infrastructural reform that we need in order to redevelop the economy, to redevelop um, the healthcare system and to also redevelop the ways in which our um, 
our markets in and of themselves continue to create this unequal society. And also because I think that the nature of um, the economy at the t in this post-COVID world and the nature of global superpowers being able to set the dictates of global economies, I don't think that um, the, uh, that capitalism will allow for the type of reform that is required. But I also don't think our own governance and governing practices, specifically around our own economies, will be able to have that muscle to create alternatives that are outside of a capitalist framework. So really, these do speak to not only capitalism as a failing economic structure, but also just as there not being enough scope or space to provide alternatives that will be that will be useful to create the type of reforms that are required once we get to this um, airy fairy idea of what a post COVID nineteen will be and world will be. And in my personal opinion, I think we're quite far from this post COVID that we're talking about because we really are at its early stages. Um, even though the consequences have been devastating, I do think it has the propensity of getting far worse, um, unfortunately. And I do not think that the type of economic, socioeconomic and political frameworks that exist currently have the ability to take us over that line once we reach the post COVID line. Yeah. Thank you so much for your response. And the last thing, just to add, oh, sure, sorry, right. just, just to add to what Lisa said, and I think, thanks so much, Lisa, for those contributions because they're just, they're, 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 they're so important. And um, in fact, I think a few weeks ago, the, the UN major group for children and youth issued, issued um, a, joint, a joint statement to the, to the high level political forum at the UN. And this is beautiful because it's different bodies from, from around the world with constituencies from just absolutely all over. And the voices of young people like those of us on this call were essentially saying, the fact that a pandemic can cause a system to collapse highlights that the system wasn't working in the first place. The very fact that the whole world has been, was on lockdown, has been on lockdown. The fact that within a week, we saw economic systems failing, shows that capitalism as we know it is not the right system for us to continue as a society. We can't be a society, we can't be a society that, if, that, that just accepts poverty and we have to do better. And I think what was so interesting with the statement that was released by young people, which links so much with what Lisha mentioned is that we have, to, we, have, we have to really change the systems that we had before. And we listed different demands for our, for our governments to listen to. The first is that we have to think beyond recovery. The current pause means that we need a fundamental shift in our current economic system. We cannot keep using GDP as our yardstick of progress. We need to adopt alternative measures in which we can define prosperity and in which we can integrate with aspects of human rights, health, and well-being. We also need to move from a linear model to a circular economy where we're buying services instead of products and whereby we are considering what, what, are, what are the ecological footprints of the work that we are doing. And I think one of the last things we demanded is that we need to mainstream youth rights and intersectionality to tackle different barriers. And this links with what, with what Fasia mentioned earlier, that youth participation cannot be tokenistic. Um, if, you, if there's actually a model called called, um, I think it's called Hart's model of, of participation, which looks at the fact that very often when young people are engaged, it's very much tokenistic. It's just having that one youth representative or once in a while it's about consulting young people. But how about integrating us into different systems so that we can make decisions as young people and be valued as equal stakeholders? So I think that definitely what has happened in the global system as we know it, has just been proof that our current models haven't been sustainable and we need to build back better, which means truly, truly including and valuing the voices of young people as we share constructive ideas to take our societies forward. Thank you, Farai, for your um, for also you know giving your input on that. The last question is: What can government do to ensure that education is accessible and available to the poor and the vulnerable who may not have access to online learning? And how do we deal with inequalities that exist in the education sector that are prevalent in dividing the rich and the poor? Okay, I see this is not our last question because um, we have one from Dr. Miller. 
So do we want to address this one first from um, Silly Bonelli and then we can move on to Darlene. We, we can't hear you for Sliha. What about now? Okay, now we can. Thank you. Okay, all right. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, so I'm going to take a take a stab at the um, first question from Silu Bonele uh, sure. around what government can do can, to ensure that ex, uh, education is accessible. So I think we do need to look at the different approaches that have been adopted both on a basic education system and a higher education system um, because I think they're quite starkly different and I think in higher education we've left students behind. Um, and it's something I hold very strong views about. And it is, of course, because of my background as a student leader and a FISMAS4 leader, in that we were very clear to say the majority of the poor students in the system don't have access to online learning. And even if you avail some amount of data, if you are in a rural area where there's no um, adequate access to electricity, number one, and number two, even if you have the data, often the um, cell phone reception is very, very poor, which means access to data doesn't really matter because of those systemic issues, right? Um, there was this, such a push to, to continue the academic year in a particular way that I think a lot of people were left behind. Um, and we saw this not just at WITS, but we saw this also at UCT and other universities, which all of a sudden were offering refunds to people who deregistered. And I think that might be because we're going to see some very interesting academic performance this year. Of course, it's juxtaposed by the balance to not lose the academic year. And I think that's very clear. Um, but I think there was more that could have been done in the higher education system. But of course, there's no perfect science to this, right? Because in the basic education system, which is where I'm now more involved in my role is, is, is in the Houting legislature, I do basic education, um, in that some schools have been able to go online, particularly private, particularly former Model C schools. Um, but we've seen them almost lose almost no academic time vis-a-vis -vis township schools and rural schools who we have to open and close, open and close, open and close. And that's because we don't have the option of just going online. People um, in, in that education sector, in basic education, are at severe risk of not going back to school. Now, this is a big, big crisis that is looming. Um, I think the UN has spoken about it, UNICEF has spoken about it. Uh, there's a huge worry all over the world that we're going to have an entire cohort of young people who do not go back to school in a post-COVID world. Um, and South Africa is terribly at risk at that. And one thing I can tell you that we did yesterday and that we're doing every week is we are checking the number of learners who are in attendance, particularly from grade 10 onward. And we are looking at approaches to go into communities to ensure that um, young people don't just drop out of school due to obviously systemic socioeconomic reasons, but that COVID uh, brought in much faster. Um, so I think there's this huge sorts of inequalities. I don't think that we can run away from them, um, but I do think that there's a balance to be met um, between going online and, and having physical um, um, contact classes that are, of course, um, within COVID regulations in which people are socially distanced. And there's one, one last point I want to make on this, because I found it very difficult um, as, as an activist and as an MP at the time. So the science of it has been very clear that children have low viral loads for COVID. It's very difficult for them to spread it to each other. Um, and in theory, we will be able to pick up very quickly if a kid has COVID because we screen them every day at schools. Now, understanding that children are very emotive elements in our society, there was a huge, huge pressure from society to close schools, even though um, scientifically speaking, medically speaking, the experts all over the world from the WHO across to South Africa were saying there's not necessarily a need. And I don't know if people saw this, but when schools were closed due to pressure from society and from, from teacher unions, the South African Human Rights Commission were very critical to say, well, you shouldn't have closed schools, you should have continued. Um, so the point I'm making here is that there is no perfect answer. It's very difficult because we live in a very unequal society but also the need to balance the fears that people have of a COVID-19 versus the science and what's factually 
true and rational. Um, and that's where I think we've missed a lot of, we miss each other all the time. Um, and that's something that I think we all need to work on a bit better. And I also think there's a huge role for media to play here as well. Um, so I kind of answered and I kind of didn't answer, but um, it's not an easy one to, to, to answer just directly as well. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, the last question is directed to you. Sorry, I keep forgetting to mute my mic. Yeah, yeah I'm, I, I do agree with, with Darlene that a more decentralized approach would be quite useful, but I, I think my, just my, my, my confidence in our higher education sector and specifically the governance around it is quite low. So I'm not sure if, if our higher education sector has the capacity to think at that level and to implement something that is um, quite um, unique and different. And I don't think that um, our governance practices around higher education allow for that type of innovative and um, different style of understanding what higher education is supposed to look like. And I also think that we're so tied to um, this traditional understanding of what the sector is supposed to look like, how it's supposed to function, um, the services in which it's supposed to provide and how it's supposed to provide those particular services, that there really is quite a limited scope for us to think beyond those traditional constraints that um, our um, governance practices around higher aid are so adamant on holding on to. So I do think that um, specifically the onus is not only on um, students to be able to create that type of conversation and to create the, um, the dialogue around those particular needs. But I also think as academics, it's also the onus, specifically younger academics as well, that have gone through the system that are now um, part of the academic um, administration. <laughs> um, I think it's also the onus on us as well to actually begin to have those type of conversations and begin to think through what kind of non-traditional forms of higher education frameworks do we think can be quite interesting in creating a different type of experience and really creating the type of decolonized, decentralized understanding of education while not compromising our competitive niche or our competitive um, standing within not only the continent but also abroad as well. You know, the, 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 the general conversation or hesitation around decolonized universities is once you decolonize, you really then um, drop the standards and you drop the competitive age or the competitive niche of particular um, universities. And I think that even in and of ourselves, we need to think through that type of thinking and ask ourselves, why do we think that? Um, and then we'll begin to understand the different ways in which we can create a different understanding of this particular institution and find ways to um, broaden our scope of what um, higher education is supposed to look like and the services it's supposed to deliver. Thank you for that. I, I've noticed that we have just gone over our, our time. So I thank everyone for um, staying with us. I just wanted to um, you know, direct this comment to Farai because I thought it was quite interesting. Uh, there was a study done by UCT Gear Business School and they basically interviewed youth about uh, their responses to COVID-19 and how they've been feeling. Um, and interestingly enough, most of them, sorry, 58% of them said that they would really like to read, hear, or watch people talk about how to become motivated about the future, as well as get practical tips for planning for their future. And they showed a very strong interest in being more active in communities, with the majority interested in sharing information about the virus, as well as helping become change makers within their communities. But I know that's something that you would obviously make you very happy to hear as well. Um, but they also wanted places to discuss um, and motivate young people around what the future, future can look like. So as we wrap up this session, um, because you had such a positive take on some of the things that we can do, you know, for people who may have ideas and are just struggling with confidence issues or don't know where to start, can you just reiterate one of those, maybe just one of those points um, to leave us on a very sort of inspired and uh, motivational note, please. Yeah, 
Yes, sure thing. So I think, I mean, what is really, really exciting about the question you asked is that it is so great to hear that there are young people who, who you know, want to be inspired, who want to actually have action. One of the discussions I was having with a colleague the other day, particularly within the youth development space, is that there is so much hopelessness amongst young people. Um, it is so difficult to get a job. I mean, COVID-19 has made things worse. It was already pretty bad before. And now we find ourselves in this space whereby it's just, it's difficult to sit around and do nothing. And we just have to do something. We have to ensure that we are somehow having an impact, not just in our own lives, but also within, within the communities we come from. I'd say for, for young people who, are, who have got different ideas, or even if you don't have an idea, but you just want to do something within your society, there are so many avenues um, for you to make a difference, but there's also so many people who are able and willing to help you on your journey. The most important thing is for you to just do it. Often we think that if we want to have an impact, we have to impact masses of people, but that's not true. If you've got an idea, talk to a friend about it, talk to a colleague about it, and make it happen. We often don't need huge amounts of money to make impact within our society. If you want to volunteer, then do that, and that will be contributing something. There are also so many different organizations that are able to, um, that are playing their part in youth unemployment. There's Youth Capital, there's Youth Lab, there's Yes for Youth, there is Harambi, there is um, Our Labs, there's Conservation South Africa, there's Youth That Work, Youth Health Africa. I could go on and on and on, and I think I tweeted about it two weeks ago. So there's so many cool organizations that are working to combat youth unemployment, that are building confidence in young people, especially Job Start is a good organization for that. So head on to there and find out how you can play your part to be involved, because literally there are so many people in the space who are willing and able to ensure that you can reach your potential. Thank you so much, Kamantha, for this opportunity. Thank you. So I want to thank every single one of you for joining us, for your time and your audience. We really appreciate it. Um, to our three panelists, you know, I'm inspired by the work that you're doing, the voices that you are having um, in your respective spaces and, and places of work. So a special thank you to Sasia, Farai, and Vishle. We really appreciate it. And is that your little cat in the back there <laughs> that just joined us? <laughs> okay, so thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for your comments, your questions. Some of you, you know, took the time to congratulate Vishli on her book. We see that and we appreciate that. Um, yes, so we look forward to having you for our masterclasses and for our events. And a very special thank you to Lerato, who's our events coordinator, for all of your amazing work that you put into our events. So have a wonderful afternoon and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.